doing i'm good you're all the way over there i am physically all the way over there you're somewhere you, else i am somewhere else <laughs> usually i'm in one place but today i'm in a different place imagine you're it in a different place imagine if you can <laughs> i'm not only just in a different place like you might think it's a different room in my house or something like that it's not this isn't even my house but get this miriam i'm not even in the united kingdom right now i know you've been making me very jealous all day with your pictures of your mountain ranges <laughs> mm -hmm. I have been fired into space. I am on a distant moon that's currently orbiting Saturn. That's where I am. And I've built this homestead and I'm recording from... That's not true. That is not true. You can have, I was going to say you can have one more and then I want the truth. <laughs> okay, just, I know okay. you say that. <laughs> <laughs> one, one more lie and then I want the facts. Um, yeah. I'm in Spain. I'm at my parents' house, what, what, where they live in Spain. And to prove that, just in case you doubt me, listener, um, uh, there's a chorizo. So you see, that's <gasps> I've got, I've just got meat on hand. That's everywhere in Spain. And um, you don't even room. eat meat. I don't, but I know people that do. So I've got to bring some home. So I'm okay. sat at my my mum's writing desk. <laughs> it's piled high with books and meat. The two, the two things. Yeah, the, the two types of sustenance that everyone needs: literature and cured meat. Um, it's a very, it's a lovely place. But yeah, I'm up in. Um, I see. When you say Spain, um, just to make this clear, because otherwise, if I say anything else about where I am, people might think I'm dissing Spain in some kind of way. I am in a very, very small village in the Alpajara region of Andalusia. So uh, it's quite old school, <laughs> if I can say that. Very old school. This house kind of has central heating kind of doesn't and as you can see the roof of the place i'm in is made out of twigs and bits of slate and that's normal <laughs> that's not something my parents have done because they're odd that's how things are done here so fabulous yeah, it's very nice out that window which you can't see are some massive massive mountains and one of them has actually still got quite a bit of snow and glacier on it so, uh, I was going to ask, cool. what, what's the weather like? It looked pretty sunny, but I noticed you were wearing quite a thick shirt. So, <laughs> It's a little bit chilly, but it's getting better. We went up to a very okay. high village today and it was, it was like, it was all right, warmish. Um, but yeah, we're at a very high elevation. I think we're at about 1,300 feet. About, we're about the height of Ben Nevis in, in this building. <laughs> So it's high, Whoa. very high. And when you drive up, my mother is now obviously like a past master at driving up to her own house, as you'd expect. <laughs> but, um, every time I come here, which is unfortunate, obviously with the recent things that have happened, not been that often, um, I always forget that the drive up um, is absolutely mortifying. It's like a lot of, it's like a Skeletric set, but with real stakes. <laughs> Like the drops are precipitous and always they're huge, huge drops into valleys. And my mum's just sort of blithely one hand on the wheel driving around. <laughs> and I'm always like, I hope we don't die. But we haven't died. We're all fine. So that's good. But yeah, it's nice. It's nice. And it's nice to be doing a podcast um, from this weird little, but like, like a retreat. It's good. Yeah. But enough, enough about my, uh, my exciting uh, continental Spanish life. Um, how about you? What's going on with I'm good, you? Yeah, uh, I'm good. Um, it's my wedding anniversary today and also yesterday and the day before. Because <laughs> we're greedy and we had a wedding over three days. So we celebrate over three days. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was about, I'm glad you came with that straight away because other people might assume that you married three different people over a period no, of three days. Same, no. same guy same chap but three times mm -hmm. so good you married him thrice I think that's... <laughs> well it was kind of just so we had like the legal ceremony on the thursday and then the big 
shebang on the Saturday and we just kind of chilled out Friday. Again, I had really hoped you were going to say we had the legal ceremony on the Friday, then the illegal ceremony on the Saturday. <laughs> it was like it yeah. was like a rave out in the countryside. No one knew where it was. Just got a text and you had to be there. I mean, it was a bit like <laughs> It was a little bit like that, yeah. It, Miriam's wedding was held at an undisclosed location in London. Um, and yeah. It, yeah, it was very, very hush hush and very exclusive, very I would say. Hush, hush. Yeah. Some, and in some, a and community just, centre. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> riddled with with media celebrities um and high flyers it was very exciting yeah. luminaries from both the, the world of uh booze and the world of broadcast it's lovely yeah what i've done here is i've kind of I've, we've, we've slid into a have you been bag without announcing it so this this is this is the we're rummaging we've already yeah. we've got we're, we're, we're elbow deep in the rummage already but so what have you been doing to celebrate your uh, your wedding anniversary we went out for dinner uh, on Monday, that was really nice. Went to the restaurant where we had like our kind of wedding breakfast. We hadn't been we hadn't been back since um, we got married, so it was really nice to go back. And the food was still ace, and everyone was still lovely. And yeah, good. It was really good. That was a wimpy, wasn't it? You you, you yeah, had your yeah, wedding, yeah, yeah. wimpy. You, yeah, you had a you had a ben- <laughs> you had a you had a bender in a bun, and um, yeah. I believe I believe. Um, Richard just had one one of their full English breakfasts. Um, so yeah, but yeah, can always can always rely on Wimpy. Great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, where did you, you do you want to plug the restaurant? Or was it secret? It was uh, Peckham not... Peckham Bazaar, which is just a lovely restaurant. Everything's delicious. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a great time. And then we drank quite a lot of wine. So yeah, we were quite giggly on the way home. It was great. That's that's very nice. So this. The previous wedding anniversary was cotton, am I right? So yeah, this what, one what, is what are we on um, now? leather. Leather. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so how, it was like... how have you manifested that exactly? Have you have you both sort of done... Did you don biker jackets that had uh, each other's names on them? Because that would be cool. Do you know Please what? Get those. I, honestly, we didn't bother with it. I got him a new pair of jeans because I couldn't be yeah. bothered to fix the pair of jeans that he has got a hole in. And um, he paid for dinner, and that was that was absolutely fine. That yeah. that sounds solid. I would, you know, <laughs> it's really solid. Because otherwise, what? I mean, you just get each other belts. I mean, it's just you know, yeah. What do you do? And it's just not very vegan friendly. That because it's yeah. Because sometimes the American yeah. one and the and the British one is different, but it's like both is just like yeah. Third anniversary leather. Yeah, I mean, well, you can do, you can do pleather, can't you? Or or that. I fine. guess so. I'd have to ask a vegan. I mean, I'm I'm sure we know a few. Be fine. Not round here though, because I I'm in as I've said. I'm in I'm in pig country. All the delicious pig products that this is where they come from. So yeah, it's very much it's very pig heavy over here. Not much vegan action. I don't eat meat, so it's 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 not tricky. But yeah, I do feel a bit like it's wasted on me because I feel like you know I should be gorging myself on various ham on. What have you? What have you it. had? What have you had for your tea? For me tea, uh, my dad cooked. It was very nice. Um, he made a delicious prawn based dish, the name of which I've already forgotten. Brilliant. <laughs> and and uh, it's very garlicky. So luckily, mm. you, I, I'm just off the kitchen area here in the spare room. But there has been a significant waft. So if you could smell in here, which you luckily can't, it is still quite seafoody and quite garlicky, which I'm enjoying. But um, I think that smells. <laughs> that sounds like it smells great. Yeah, he did. My dad's a very good cook, so it's been, it's is, been very yeah. nice. So uh, it's been quite nice not to have to do anything. And I spent most of yesterday uh, just reading the uh, the book Hoods about Nottingham criminals while sat in front of an open fire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are properly in holiday mode. What a treat. I'm, li- I'm loving life. <laughs> so yes. It's and it's great because um, my parents both taught in Nottingham schools for a very, very long time. Uh, so occasionally whilst I'm reading the book Hoods about Nottingham gangsters, I can just glance over and go, did you know this one? My mum will go, yep, yep, <laughs> taught that one. I go, dad, do you know that one? He's like, yep, yep, remember that one. <laughs> so <laughs> it seems that they have taught pretty much every wrong him that Nottingham has produced. Maybe if they'd done a better job teaching them physics and biology respectively, they wouldn't have turned to crime. It's a theory. It's a theory. That's unfair. Because the thing is, you know, certain things in your life, certain small decisions in your life can change the very course of what happens in your future. Do you see what I did there? Did you see what I did there? Wow. Was quite, I wasn't. Was you quite... know, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> it was weird. I don't know if I liked it. Well, let's just go with it. 
Chapter 90s. What is it that we're talking about in this particular episode? What have we ha- what are we we going to bestow upon the listener? Well, we're talking about rom-coms from the 90s and we did a bit of a shout out about to ask people what their favorite rom-com from the 90s was and producer neil brought forth this one which is a bit of a sliding doors sliding doors neil as i remember um neil producer voice of god um our lord savior and maker of audio nice um you were very 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 insistent that we did sliding doors i've, I've never known anyone so keen that we did sliding doors um we were you were like almost rubbing your hands of, of being able to watch it again so neil can you explain to me why why were you so keen for us to review sliding doors oh wow um i don't know i've been i've been thinking about sliding doors for a while because is uh, this is my biggest question for you and you can discuss this does sliding doors count as a sci-fi film and that's why i wanted to watch it again because i think it is it's a sci-fi film because it's dealing with parallel worlds classic sci-fi i mean according to uh the numbers.com it's classed as a drama well that could still mean it's sci-fi but it's classed as a drama mm. i don't know what I, I, I don't know what the numbers.com is um but i'm looking at another website which is just classed it as a documentary and this other, this other <laughs> obscure website which no, is but the it numbers is, is like which is quite <laughs> it's um it's for like the like so i was looking at it as to the top grossing romantic comedies of all time oh i see that makes more sense i was looking <laughs> for stats that's what i was looking for um and i were and it it wasn't ranking um on the rom-com so i was like but why but that's because it's it's as a a drama. Well, I'll, I'll say this. Let's put a pin in the discussion of what genre Sliding Doors falls into for now. But that's a pin that we can still access where necessary. So it's quite a large pin and we've not pushed it in all the way. So we can still get at that pin. And um, we'll put that there. But I mean, I suppose the question that I'll put out to both of you, what is a Sliding Doors? What is a Sliding Doors? <laughs> okay, well, a Sliding Doors, essentially... It's a situation which splits. So the central premise for this film is that Gwyneth Paltrow, she misses a train, a tube train. Uh, the door closes because the girl gets in the way. And one version of her actually skips around it and gets in, and the other one doesn't. She gets stuck. And then it's the ramifications of that being played out. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> He's coming with a strong opinion. It's beautiful. It's, it's coming with a very strong opinion. I, I will declare an interest. I had never seen Sliding Doors. You'd never, never seen, seen it? it nope. Nope. Not seen Sliding Doors. I'm not even ashamed. I've just not seen Sliding Doors. There's a couple of reasons why I haven't seen Sliding Doors. Well, um, one, because I'm not really a rom-com kind of guy. I don't hate a rom-com, but um, it's just, I find something about like rom-coms especially ones set in the united kingdom often just sort of make me ever so slightly furious just a little bit like not you know i'm not smashing stuff up but i just think it's it's something about the internal smugness of a british rom-com that generally makes me annoyed and i think i'd already been burned by four weddings is that was that before this i feel like it was i feel like i've been burned by four weddings and then obviously john Hanna is also in that film and i was like no no john Hanna, you won't get me again I won't allow this to descend into a Kevin Costner situation. But a different director, it. so you could have given it a chat. A different director, because that, that is the thing, because quite a few of those rom-coms, uh, Notting Hill, Love Actually, Four Weddings, are all directed by the same same guy. This isn't a Richard Curtis, just it isn't. No, if it had been a Richard Curtis, I may have dismissed it out of hand. I may have said, <laughs> you, you're going to have they... to get some, someone else in. <laughs> They are on the list, quite high on the list of the top grossing romantic comedies of all time. So people well, like them. I, I can, and I can, you know, f- having seen Sliding Doors for the very first time yesterday, yeah, um, I can see why people liked it. I can understand okay. why people liked it. I mean, I wouldn't say it's in the same realm as, you know, I'll put it this way. 
here are the chances of me watching Sliding Doors again after today. Yeah. They're zero. They're a nice uh... round zero. <laughs> I'm not going to watch it again. Am I glad I watched it the first time? Sure I am. Sure I am. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the whole thing. I find I found it quite exciting throughout. I, I found it, you know, it was a pleasurable watch. Is it one I'm going to revisit over time? It's unlikely. But, you know, it was a good microcosm of the 90s, but I did have a few issues with it. But, I mean, where do we begin with sliding doors? Do we, do we, do we require a hot synopsis? I mean, Neil gave us quite, quite a, a decent synopsis, but, I mean, should we flesh it out somewhat more? I haven't prepared a hot synopsis, but I'm prepared to give it a go. <laughs> Or would you like to take on the mantle of explaining to everyone the plot of Sliding Doors? I've got some, I have got some bits that I could muddle together as a plot synopsis, but I would like to know while you're in that hole of not watching it again, dissing one of Neil's favourite films, um, maybe if you could list some of your favourite bits of the film. (laughs) Okay, sure, sure. Favourite bits of the film. Uh, Okay. I very much enjoyed the opening sequence for a couple of reasons. Um, I I don't know what the song was that was playing. Um, What I'd written about the song that initially started it, I was going to research who that actually was, but I forgot. And I've just written, diabolical opening song, Who is Responsible? It's kind of something I put, sounds yet more shameful than Jamiroquai. I think it might actually be Jamiroquai, but I feel like if it is Jamiroquai... It's like at their lowest ebb. It's the worst Jamiroquai song that Jamiroquai have ever done. But if it's not Jamiroquai, it's somebody trying to be Jamiroquai, but kind of failing to Jamiroquai, which is, I mean, what is there a sadder indictment of a musical endeavour than you failed to Jamiroquai? Jamira don't. <laughs> and then whilst that's happening... She so she wakes up in a lovely apartment, list and, and then it's it's non diegetic. It's not like she's listening to this song; it's just playing. And then she spills a cup of tea on her copy of To Kill a Mockingbird. Did you notice yeah. that? That's the book that she's reading. Is she yeah. doing her GCSEs? What's going on with that? <laughs> Who is rereading To Kill a Mockingbird in their sort of, what early thirties? Who's doing that? I don't understand. So that that sort of baffled me. And the fact that she took it with her anyway didn't dry it off. But yeah, she's obviously that committed to reading um, To Kill a Mockingbird. So yeah. what, what in, in the initial sequence, what we're getting is a lovely sense of, of, of Gwyneth Paltrow, who plays a character called Helen. Her lovely London life. She's listening to Shit Jamiroquai. Um, she's spilling tea on a book. She's in a bit of a rush. She's off. She's out. She's going to work. She telephones an elderly gentleman who runs a sandwich shop um, to order a sandwich on the way, which frankly, if you're late, seems a little bit ridiculous. And then she buys a load of booze for some reason, which she'll explain later. Then she gets to her office where she is sacked for being a baddie. And these were your favourite bits? Yeah, I loved the opening sequence. I loved the setup. Yeah. I thought it was dead good. Um, I also found it really good that there was a long period of time when you could see Gwyneth Paltrow. It's like, that's Gwyneth Paltrow. That's Gwyneth Paltrow. I didn't know that Gwyneth Paltrow is English in this film. (laughs) So one of my favourite things was she gets to the office and then one of her colleagues, who I know to be an English actor, is doing quite a bad American accent. And then she (laughs) speaks and she's doing an English accent. And I was like, this is topsy-turvy crazy times. (laughs) But I will say there's sort of two options for most Americans when doing an English accent, especially around this period. And those two options are, cool, blimey, governor, which he doesn't do. And the other one is, uh, 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 yeah, which she does do. So she goes for posh lady. And you know what? I think it's solid. I think Paltrow's accent is pretty good. I mean, it didn't endear me to her because it's quite an annoying accent, but it's, it's very believable. Did it does get so? better. I think I think it gets better. I think initially I was like I remember seeing it in the cinema and not knowing who Gwyneth Paltrow was and then being annoyed when I found out that she was American because I thought it was really good. So I must have been completely fooled as a teenager. But I think when you watch it again now, like at the beginning, it's like, oh that that doesn't yeah. yeah. I think I wrote her accent is flawless. Ha ha ha. <laughs> That's my first note. <laughs> See, it's not, it's not flawless, but I will say this, and, and in many ways, this is perhaps more cruel, but it is the truth. <laughs> Which is, <laughs> I, I, I found myself halfway through thinking, I think I prefer British Gwyneth Paltrow 
Do you know what I mean? Like, okay. I think she makes more sense as a British lady. I think it's because the only time I really hear Gwyneth Paltrow talking now is when it's her talking about her various health health in depth for anyone just listening to the podcast i'm doing very heavy air quotes as i say the word <laughs> health um health brand goo and when she does that she has that kind of california drawl um that just sort of makes me go oh this is all just bullshit isn't it which obviously it, it, it um for legal reasons i'm not going to say whether it is or it is not but uh yeah so i thought i find her more relatable as a british lady and i'd like to say right now if gwyneth paltrow as i'm sure she is listening um maybe just commit to it maybe just become <laughs> a british madonna did it she was mocked but you know she if she'd committed i reckon she'd have got away with it Obviously, the main character here is Paltrow as Helen, the main protagonist. Yeah. But there's some other big players in here, um, and the Ooh, main yeah. one is the main one. I would say is old old Johnny Hannah, <laughs> old JH. Um, and I think I said I said yeah. this to you recently, but I will reiterate that me and my brother. I don't know where this started. I think it was when we saw him in Four Weddings and a Funeral. Um, we gave John Hannah the name Needy Rasidi. <laughs> <laughs> And o- always so refer to him as, as such because I think it's because he's got a receding hairline, which is fine. We, I mean, we, we're all getting there. And um, but very pleading eyes. Very, do you know what I mean? He's got his eyes kind of look like he he needs constant reassurance. So I think the name Needy Rasidi kind of stuck. So I spent the entire yeah. time just sort of looking at him, going, "Old oh, Needy Rasidi." <laughs> <laughs> And he's got, I mean, his first um, scene is just, he's just got verbal diarrhea on a train, hasn't he? He's just talking at her for ages. There was definitely a decision made that people think that John Hannah's character is charming. And I, I'd sort of beg to differ on a, quite a few levels that he's, I don't think he was. <laughs> I found him sort of annoying and also at points kind of like, so for instance, um, yeah, he he talks a lot. Um, which is fine. I mean, I can't say anything about that. But throughout the whole film, one of, I mean, I, d- I hesitate to call it a running joke, but his running joke is to say, remember what the Monty Python boys say? And obviously they think he means there's always look on the bright side of life. But then he actually says, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. Is that what it's about? Because I didn't get that yeah. at all. And I was just like, why is he constantly saying nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition? Like, what? The reason why I keep saying it is because the first time it happens, the joke doesn't particularly land because, let's be honest, it's not really a joke. It isn't a joke at all. No. <laughs> it's just words. <laughs> the director, Peter Howard, is so committed to this gag that I think it comes up like six more times, culminating in a period of time where he's in a restaurant with his friends and they're all laughing uproariously as he does the whole Spanish Inquisition Monty Python routine for them. And at that point, I just went, if I was Gwyneth Paltrow, at this point, I'd just go, I'm sorry, mate, this is not for me. I can't be doing all this chat. It's going to be nights that say knee. It's going to be, um, you've been oh, a very naughty been good. boy. <laughs> it's just going to be Monty Python shy all the time, every time you've had half a glass of wine. Bollocks to this. I'm going to I'm going to go back to that other weirdo whose hairline is slightly less receding who's having an affair. That's what I would have done. But yeah, I found John Hanna like they sometimes in those films they sort of try and make a character charming and you can't you can't force it. You can't really script charming, I don't think. And I don't think he quite it quite got away with it. How did you feel about Hannah? I remember being very charmed when I watched it back in the day. And then now I think I was quite shocked at the scene where he he is just, you know, the first thing he's just talking at her and not really, you know, she is on a train like by herself reading a book. And she at one point just says to him, like, I'm reading my book. Can you stop talking to me? You're a strange man on a train. (laughs) And he just doesn't really back off. So like, I don't know if that would fly now. (laughs) But then it's like, oh, sweet, nerdy man. Isn't that cute? And it's now it's like, "Mm, you're harassing it now. Stop it. Yeah. Oh, oh, definitely. I, I, I did wonder how. Um. I think this is the unfortunate thing is that I don't know if they homage this, but it very much reminded me of uh, that James Blunt, the, the James Blunt song "You're Beautiful," because it's like got that whole line about how was how he smiled at you on this. I think he says subway, but I think the implication is it's on the London Underground. Um, you're with another man, and um, then 
uh, that that kind of I've, I felt like these are two things where it's a bloke going it's not creepy like the screenwriter and James Blunt were going it's not creepy to chat women up on public transport it's romantic women like it and I'm like they don't they really don't don't chat women up on public transport just don't it's not ever acceptable or cool to do that which is a shame it'd be great if you know well, i think some some do i think it's just like the you know there were some quite big cues of like no please stop talking to me yeah. and i think being a bit more sensitive and saying oh actually and then like f- getting off the train at the same time kind of following her like don't do that yeah i've had people like i think when i was living in like north london there was um i was walking back from the shops and um i heard like footsteps behind me it's in the day and this guy had followed me and he was just like, he was really, he was being really sweet. And he was just like, oh, you know, I think his, uh, like, I think his chat up line was like, how old are you or something? And I was just like, what? Look. <laughs> <laughs> but bless him, I think he was like 18. And I was just like, listen, you don't follow someone. It's not going to work. No, I'm not interested. I'm a lot older than you. Here's some information for you to take away from this situation. I'm not, I'm not cross. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> I was about to say, that's so phenomenally kind of you <laughs> to, do that, to say to someone, all right, listen, I can see what you've done here. I can see what you've done yeah. here. Obviously, I'm the bomb diggity, so I can see why you would want to be no, talking it's, to me. It's but let very me say, sweet. I'm, no, it's, I'm you're not saying that, but I'm saying but... that. <laughs> But you turn around and go like, let, let me first reject you, which I will be doing. But let me also, which which you did not have to do, is to say, this is not a good strategy. Don't pursue this. You seem like an all right sort of dude, but this is not the way to go about things. You, you don't, don't want to do that. If you'd have been on that tube, like facing that altercation and seeing Paltro and Needy Rasidi, you'd have just like, give Paltro a look, turn around to Rasidi and gone, mate. <laughs> Like, yeah, or just not been like interested. The little, just like you're right, like to her. I'm. You, I wouldn't give him. And this, hap- I think that has happened before when someone's been really uncomfortable, and I've just been like, "Are you okay? Absolutely no interest in talking to the bloke whatsoever. Oh, Is she yeah. okay?" Also, I just think it's one of them things where, especially because that was almost at commuter time on the, on the tube. Yeah, and generally, I think what would have really happened in real life is that if if someone had started speaking to me on a commuter tube in London, I'd have gone, I'm simply going to pretend this isn't happening. I'm going to stare directly she ahead. Does, well, she does. She tries to do that for ages. I think that's the problem. She keep, tries, She does exactly coming. the right thing. It just keeps going. Because he's so but, um, needy. <laughs> Such a needy receiver. Needy receiver. You, see, you see why he has this name. Don't lie, Matthias. Right, quick, quickly, this synopsis, let's come on, let's stop being mean to John Hunter. <laughs> Can we, again, can we put a pin in being mean to John Put Hannah? a pin in we'll me. Come, we'll come back to it later. So okay, you're so- right. She gets up. She gets fired because she borrows some Smirnoff. Not vodka, specifically Smirnoff. There's Very a couple specific. of big brand names in this. There, there are. <laughs> Then oh, misses she misses a train but doesn't as already outlined by Neil. Thank you very much. Um, so she, one of she's we split the story into in terms of missing the train. Um, the one that misses the train nearly gets mugged, hits her head on a tree, and the taxi driver takes her to A and E. Right. Yeah. The one on the train gets stuck with needy receipty verbal diarrhea. <laughs> It, they, they, we learn that she's a Gemini, which is significant because of the two, the twin. Didn't even pick I up suppose. on that. Didn't uh, even that, pick up on that. I wrote it down. <laughs> it must have been significant. Um, she gets, one of them who gets home early catches her boyfriend 
having sex with somebody that isn't her and she gives him a spectacular bollocking i wrote down she, that's a good it's a good telling off that that's a good telling off um people smoke in bars that's what i've written down oh there's a <laughs> like my plot synopsis has kind of weakened at this point um <laughs> and then i put there's a there's a good night sweetheart scene because the best friend of John Lynch's character, so the 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 boyfriend, the ex boyfriend in some cases, um, <coughs> is uh, his best friend's called Russell, who is just like the character in Good Night Sweetheart, you know, in Nicholas Lentus. Is we we're gonna have to talk about this at another um, podcast for sure. I had a very long conversation with our friend Joe, different Joe, not the Joe that was on. The other one, anyway, um, about Good Night Sweetheart. <laughs> so Nicholas Lindhurst, if that's the cheating guy, then Ron is Russell, basically. Easy. Um, there's a lot of Grolsch. <laughs> People <laughs> drink a lot of Grolsch. So uh, much Grolsch. There's so much there's Grolsch a, in this film. Uh, yeah. I've got questions um, about the amount of Grolsch in this film. Uh, there's Oh, and the thing that makes me feel that it's a rom-com is that there's quite a lot of numbering things. So quite at the beginning, like he goes, okay. one, that was close. And two, you're talking to yourself in the mirror again. And then uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's best friend says, one, you're still counting the end of your relationship in days. And two, you're reading his horoscopes. There's quite a lot of numbering happens. Is that, is that a quite rom-com a rom-com hallmark? Comedy thing. It felt like it was. It, I'd say it felt. Anyway, I've got nothing to back that up, but I said it felt like it. Um <laughs> And oh, Neil, that's a good point. He just wrote duality. I think that's duality. yeah. With the no, yeah, because there's one and two. It's like one, two, Gemini. It's like mm. the same. We've got two things happening. Lovely stuff. Mm. Thank you, Neil. Um, the one that misses the train follows Jerry and then finds out. So she, then she does find out that he's cheating on her. So that uh, oh, I've put Anna's got weird taste in decor. What did I mean about that? Oh yes, coloured bottles in a house and lots of weird shit everywhere. Um, <laughs> Oh, and then at this point in the film, I've just written, in case you weren't sure what's happening, Russell's here. So Russell, the best friend in the pub, good night, sweetheart guy, just reminds you what's going on. Um, the PR firm that she then launches, the one that's doing all rights, had a haircut, launches a PR firm. There's a lovely montage, um, which is almost exactly the same frame for frame as the Natalie Umbrulia video for Torn. There's a lot of very similar colours and outfits in that. <clears throat> yeah, I'll give you that. That's um, very true. And uh, Jerry spots Helen in the pub, right, doing a dance with Needy Rasidi. And I can't understand how he knows that it's her because he walks past the pub with a very high window. She's about three people in facing the other way with completely different hair. There's no way he spotted her. That is an absolute nonsense. I'm just, I wrote that in capital letters. I was so angry. <laughs> and I like oh, this if, film. If, if you wrote it in big, then that's really bad. I wrote it that's in really big. Bad. Uh, we're nearly there. I've put a lot about Clive's hair. Um, there's a restaurant launch because a PR firm's doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well and we'll be, we will be coming back to that. That's, I've, I've got a lot of thoughts on her PR firm. <laughs> Um, and then I did get a bit confused at the end because I wasn't sure whether she died and I had to rewind it and work it out. Um, and then at the end, if you're watching it on Amazon, you get a bit of facts and it just said the original role was offered to Minnie Driver. And that's my plot synopsis, which is terrible and patchy at best. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Do you know what? I love that plot synopsis for two reasons. That One, it covered quite a lot of the main points that I was, uh, I was interested in, specifically the absolutely unnecessary insertion of Grolsch into every social situation in this film. Everywhere. But more, <laughs> but more than that, um, it made me, you know, feel a little bit better about my plot synopsi. Uh, because you you just, you ploughed through, you didn't lose faith. That was enough. And that's what I need to do. I need to just keep on. But I will say, you know, spoilers be damned. I like to think of it like this, that you've got long-haired Paltrow and short-haired Paltrow. Never yeah. you mind that she doesn't cut her hair for quite a while <laughs> in that reality. But let's just say you've got long-haired Paltrow, you've got short-haired Paltrow. Long-haired Paltrow sad, short-haired Paltrow happy. Long-haired Paltrow lives, short-haired Paltrow dies. Oh. Uh, so that's what you've got. So, But it makes you feel like long-haired Paltrow could become short-haired Paltrow at some point. 
Yeah, I'm not. What I'm, I want to be clear about that is I'm not suggesting that the haircut was, you know, instrumental in her demise. I don't think the hair no, was no, the linchpin no. that ended up doing her in. But, it mean, was it just unlucky. Helped. It was just unlucky. I would have thought, hopefully, if her hair had been more out of her face, she might have been able to avoid that van. But, um, you know, apparently not. Uh, the other thing I thought about this film is there's, there's two central male friendships that go on. And that is between... Yes. And I will say, like, so her boyfriend, who is a bastard... Um, Jerry. Jerry. So they're living this lo lovely London life. She works in PR and Jerry's trying to write a novel. Ironically... Or not ironic. I mean, you know, Alanis Morissette. Ironically, John Lynch, <laughs> the guy that plays Jerry, is a novelist in real life now. He's is written he two really? novels. Is he really? Is he really? I didn't know Art. that. There you go. Fact. Art imitating life. Indeed, I think he probably got the idea for it whilst doing this film. He was like, I just love the idea of being a novelist. I'm going to write a couple of novels, and um, he's having an affair uh, with Lydia, who's an, an American, uh, played by Jean Triplehorn. Which is a <laughs> lovely, name. fabulous name. Jean Triplehorn, I think to me, is one of the best people in this film. And Jean Triplehorn's got a very, very, very checkered film history. I will say that. Um, but did you notice when you researched this with most of the cast of this film, a lot of them were in this film and like almost nothing else. A lot of them, you're like Sliding Doors, Holby City, The Bill, uh... and then like nothing. That's what, but Triplehorn... She's in Sliding Doors, obviously, top performance. Uh, she is also in Waterworld. Is she, she now? She's triple horn. <laughs> she, it, get, it actually gets worse, believe it or they not. Can't. She's in Mickey, Mickey Blue Eyes. Oh, oh. triple horn. <laughs> and then ju just to get like when you think, all right, that's the worst it can get. She's in Swept Away. Triple horn. Triple horn needs a new... Like, if you're out there, triple horn... Hopefully you've got a better agent since the the 90s and early noughts. She's good in this. She is funny in this. She's good. That's what I'm saying. I feel like her representation is not doing her justice. Whoever's bringing her scripts like Mickey Blue Eyes and Swept Away and telling her that she should be in them, is, is, it's unacceptable. It's completely unacceptable. I didn't recognise. I, I wasn't thinking about who was in what, really. And then I was just looking for some pictures and just, like you know, scrolling through. And I saw a picture of the director and i was like that's a guy from bread it's joey boswell from bread it's joey boswell from bread <laughs> and i was like oh that's one of the, the, the great joys of sliding doors is that it, there's like when i was looking up the sort of trivia facts about as i use it like cause i'm quite a lazy researcher i generally look about like oh what's an interesting fact about that but they hadn't really put it as an interesting fact but the most interesting fact about sliding doors is that it is the directorial debut and screenwriting debut of Joey Boswell from Bread. <laughs> his real name is Peter Howitt. And his, yeah. I'm sorry, but his Wikipedia page is amazing. I <laughs> Do you think he wrote it himself? absolutely love it. I don't care. Do you know what? And if he did, fair play to him because it is beautiful. Because it is basically, if you haven't seen it already, go and have a look. It's basically a spreadsheet. And it's colour coded. It's just I I loved it because it's got his filmography and his like TV like appearances, and it says um, it's just got columns as to whether he was an actor, a director, or a producer or a screenwriter. And it's just got colour coded yes or no. Yeah. So if it's no, it goes red, and if it's yes, it's like green. So yes, you can see it's see very detailed, like whether he what exactly he did on each thing. And I was like, I have never seen that before, and I'm here for it. It was very organised and stunning. <laughs> so I, I agree Love with you. I 100% agree with you. I'd forgotten about that. But I, and I did think, which is true, right? There's only two reasons that could be the case. Uh, one's, one, I don't know which is better. One is that he did it himself, <laughs> which fair enough. If you want to curate your own Wikipedia page, you know, he's Joey Boswell from Bread. He's not, he's not nobody. He's not no one. You go for it. Uh, but the other thing is, the only other time, the only other reason that Wikipedia page could be like that is if Peter Howard has an obsessive fan. He has like or, one person, uh, an administrator who is like think? a kindred spirit of mine. <laughs> yeah. Well, t funny enough, I did read. I don't know if you read this that he had a nervous breakdown whilst um, right right in sliding doors. 
He's quite open about this. This is not breaking news. He had a full-on nervous breakdown whilst writing Sliding Doors um, because I'd, 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 it, it didn't make it clear whether it was because he was finding Sliding Doors very difficult to write. But yeah, he did. This is this is a labour of, 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 of passion and love that he managed to make Sliding Doors. And in many ways, I sort of thought that's weird to imagine someone, you know, spending that, that much kind of emotional labour over Sliding Doors. But then I thought about it and I thought, he never made a film before. And he yeah. absolutely believed in this script. And whatever yes. you think about the film Sliding Doors, he was 100% correct to believe in that script because it was a massive hit. So, yeah. And not only is it a massive hit, but it then spawned the term Sliding Doors just into general parlance in the world as a thing That's meaning huge. where you have two different decisions and you go either way. And I'm like, if your film, your first film and your first screenplay inserts a conceptual idea into the english language and it's still being used now you're like geez that's big and then in, that's i think huge. maybe he had he had that problem writing it because he must have he kind of knew that this was a big deal that like this film could be huge and it it, it was and it's just it is a bizarre story isn't it just like joey boswell from bread <laughs> <laughs> i think i'm made, so excited about that though. Successful film, yeah. Can I? I need to. I need to speak to you about um, something quite important that's been upsetting me quite a lot about this film. Well, it's not upsetting sure. me, but I just it's on, massively on my mind, and I just need to get it mm. off my chest. And that is the um, distribution between male and female characters of you know what I'm going to say. What are you going to say? Eyebrow hair. Eyebrow oh, hair. Oh, yeah. Because the male characters get so much eyebrows, so much, it's untrue. Like it's like ma- like two Magnum PI mustaches on both oh, of God. their eyes. You're so right. And the women, they the women's nothing. drawn on with like a propelling pencil. It's yeah. barely there. It's nothing. It's just that yeah. tiny bit, a little bit of dental floss just above the eye. Exactly. That's it. It's unfair. I just think it's an unfair distribution. Is she startled? We just don't know. We can't tell any of their facial expressions. Whereas, yeah, you're right. Well, I think obviously the the implication is that Gwyneth Paltrow's got a type. She likes men with enormous, thick brows. Huge. (laughs) Huge. It's like two gerbils stuck to his face. I mean, really enormous eyebrows. I I couldn't look at anything else. I couldn't look at anything else. But yeah. they're, they're, cra- they're crazy th- well yes the eye th- th- is unacceptable and i will say uh, focusing on that so there are three central relationships aside from the romantic relationships in this film the yes. friendships i'm talking about here so you've got jerry the asshole and his friend what is, what is his friend called russell. russell russell so jerry and russell yeah jerry jerry's an asshole Russell is, in my opinion, even more of an asshole. And oh, the weird he's thing great. about it is, I, <laughs> I think great. Russell is Joey Boswell. I'm just going to call him Joey Boswell now, if that's all right. I know he's called Peter Howard, but it's more fun to call him Joey Boswell. <laughs> is I think he's Joey Boswell's self insert because every time I've seen him talking um, in interviews, which is not that much because he hasn't done that many, but the ones I have seen, his way of talking is quite similar to is the way it? Russell talks. I think that that friend is is him. That's who he is. He's that that's that kind of like because also you think Russell he's quite sort of quippy. He's got like he's sort of he's sort of standing back from it all, sort of faintly amused by it. Um, yeah. And I think that's sort of the role that Peter Howard has. Um, I, and I think that's what it is. But I found those two. I was like, this relationship is is unacceptable. You've got a bloke having a torrid affair and another bloke sort of sitting by being faintly amused by it all and then sort of not i was like what what are either of you getting out of this that relationship didn't make any sense to me at all um and then you've got the friendship between john hannah and his friend clive so needy receding oh, and clive, clive. Oh, clive. <laughs> this little red tip tear red tips <laughs> it's little red tips <laughs> So good. Clive's red tips. So he's got a mate called Clive, right? And Clive is what we call him a restaurateur. It's never clear whether Clive is, yeah. is is cooking the food. I don't think he is. It's he the nineties. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it's it's just, the nineties. It's coming. Oh, whatever. And um, it was cool. And so when he's he's trying to launch his restaurant, 
just launch yeah. a restaurant as you do and yeah. um, he hasn't he hasn't got a pr firm so gwyneth paltrow who's recently set up this pr firm which by the way if you want to know how to set up a pr firm you just paint it turquoise you get a room yeah. you get a loan from nat west that will be about yeah. 48 hours and they'll just give you as much money as you need <laughs> then you paint you paint a room turquoise and if you do yeah. that then you turn around turn back and there'll be a woman in it with a computer who just make <laughs> loads of stuff happen for you <laughs> Yeah, Never there's a few montages. <laughs> yeah, it's a good. That's a good montage. The, uh, the restaurant launch, great montage. The PR firm, great montage. But you, everyone knows. Surely, all our listeners know how much we bloody love a montage on love this a montage. podcast. <laughs> I might eventually, if it, if it weren't for the fact that obviously it would be a copyright nightmare, I'd like to do yep. a, a montage of 90s montages. I think that would be, be a really beautiful watch. <laughs> when <laughs> when mont- we're montage allowed cubed. to host something along the lines of Auntie's Bloomers, they'll let us, surely they'll let us do that. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I wouldn't mind just a show that was on once a week just called Montage. Where we, yes. we just bring together a sort of mega mix of montages we've looked at because there's so many good ones out there, and this this film is replete with a couple of real great montagery. And um, what I particularly liked, I don't know if you clock this. What did uh, what did Clive call his uh, new restaurant venture? Did you notice that Clive's Bar? <laughs> it's called Clive's Bar and Restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. And I presume right. The Because it didn't show you the outside of the bar, but it did show you the inside. And the inside, there was a banner. Now, presumably, that banner would have been made by the PR company to advertise it. That is awful. <laughs> that, that font, that choice of font, Gwyneth, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> that, that would shame a local minicab firm. They'd be like, no, that looks shit. We can't put that up outside. That's No, we can't do that. Just says Clive's Bar and Restaurant, sort of skew whiff on a wall no one seems to be eating anything in this bar. <laughs> no one is eating anything well There's they've a got a lot of lovely lovely wall. fresh red peppers on a string <laughs> which i'd like to see what that looked like the following day when they've gone a bit shriveled and well, yeah do you rec- did you think they were real or just placky <laughs> they look real they're either going rotten or dusty one or the other so it's either a cleaning nightmare or just a massive health and safety disaster so i, I, don't I think they're which. real because actually plastic fruit for props is actually really expensive so i think they were real <laughs> Do you think like that's the theme of his restaurant? You come in and you say, um, "What do you want?" Everything that he sells is pepper based, or just, just I think it was everything is just hung <laughs> on a string from the ceiling. Yeah, so there's the bread's over there, the peppers over here, a couple of eggs. So this is the this is. Have you eaten with us before? You haven't. Okay, well I can understand that because Clive's Bar and Restaurant has just opened. So where, you're at the pepper station. Come here, choose your pepper, choose your pepper there, take that down, then go over to the, st- the stuffing area. That you, Then you just stuff into the pepper what you want, pass it back to us, we'll bake that up for you, then you come back and we'll dangle it on a string and you can bob for it like it's Halloween. That's that's what Clive's Bar and Restaurant is. Do you know what? I'd go to that. I'd go to that. <laughs> Do you know, uh, that's the thing. As I was saying that, I was like, I'm really <laughs> like, liking sure. this. this. It sounds like sounds a cross between right. a, a hipster restaurant and Goose Fair. I'm all the way in. <laughs> that sounds yeah. great. We'll flesh, this, we'll flesh this out afterwards because I think this has got legs. I don't yeah. know if it, but we will have to call it Clive's Bar. If, even if I could change <laughs> both of our names to Clive by deed poll, we're calling it Clive's Bar and Restaurant. Just so one person, maybe just Joey Boswell, We'll get that and be like, that's an homage to Sliding Doors, which is be, be worth it. The 90s. I've got some questions actually that I might, I don't know whether to ask you or to ask them to Neil, I don't, or both, I don't know. But basically they're questions that if this, because going back to what Neil said about this being kind of like a sci-fi thing, if this was part of a bigger world and maybe there were uh, there was another film or more films you can tell i've just seen the trailer to the new stranger things um <laughs> if it was to be expanded upon um i have some questions about the kind of whole thing so maybe if you could maybe both answer and if they're different answers that'd be fine um sure i'm going to go out on a limb and say you can ask the question you're going to get a considered response from neil and you're going to get an absolute bullshit soap from me so just be prepared I for for those can't soap. wait well neil can go first um <laughs> sure can this time splitting situation and don't like if you don't know just make it up um can this time splitting situation happen to just anyone 
Yes or no? Well, yes. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 100%. Okay. Yeah. Um, if the multiverse exists, then, then mm. anything that we do is, is, is splitting universes. Brilliant. Um, who <laughs> observes this parallel situation? So, it can as someone viewing this whole situation, can someone see the multiple? Joey Boswell from Bread. <laughs> jo- Joey Boswell from Bread can see every sing- every time you make a decision in your life, no matter how small, <laughs> it splits off into a parallel universe. And the only person who can see every single one of them is Joey Boswell from Bread. And that is very much why he had a nervous breakdown. He had oh, to that must be the- awful. Yeah. yeah. He, he sees all our mistakes, all our missteps, but ultimately, you know, Joey knows that's how it is. That's how it is. And he wrote Sliding Doors to try and explain the turmoil that he, he has to go through. Um, and it was misinterpreted as a delightful rom-com, but right. that's how it happens. Right. Uh, same question to Neil. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> they they see the other yeah. side because there's constant references of the other world in, in the other one. Well, like, like the a, deja vu mm, type thing. The things. deja vu bit. The uh, Gwyneth knowing the ending, the, the um, Monty Python bit. She knew it. Yeah. yeah, and she didn't know why she knew it. Oh, yeah. You see? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, can... Uh, can time be split by anyone? So could someone make it happen or is it just arbitrary? Yeah, the only people that can do it uh, are Transport for London. You, okay. can, you, can split, you can split time on a tube. That's the easiest. You can split time on a bus, but it takes longer and it's a lot less reliable. Uh, you can split time on a train, but again, it's quite expensive. So yeah, that's, that's just, it's Transport for London who can do it. Okay. Uh, Neil? Uh Anywhere there's a, a mechanical door. <laughs> um, lovely. And my final question, does time splitting occur only for love reasons? Mm. I just wanted to say love. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think any time you split off into two parallel universes, love is a possibility. But I think as soon as you make that split, you are hurtling towards a potentially good mediocre or bad haircut and everything will stem from there so every time you make a decision in your life that will lead you to another hair based um your future and you know in the, in the future that i'm currently living in i've got pretty sweet fade that is coming in nicely after a couple of weeks but you know in another world where i didn't go to the barbers that was across my street and get that sweet sweet haircut yeah i'm looking like shit <laughs> who knows and neil is it love or hair or something else it's hair based. Everything is it's hair, also based. hair based. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Look after your hair, people. <laughs> Look Thank after you. your hair. That's... The rest of your life will look after itself. That's a motto that I think everyone should live by. And to your main point which I'm just going to lean gently over and remove that pin that we put in earlier about this being a sci fi film. I've taken it out. It's sharp oh, I thought you meant the around. John Hanna mean one. Okay, that's the good. Yeah, the, that one. No, yeah. no, no. We'll, yeah. leave, we'll leave John Hanna alone. Um, but um, I think he's taken enough, taken enough punishment in this podcast. I, I don't think it's a sci-fi film. I don't think that it's a sci-fi film. But what I do think is that it's a philosophical treatise on the human condition. That's what I think it is. And what I find that I, I, I know, did you notice this? There's a lot of river imagery in this film. Yeah. He's rowing on a river. A lot of the central scenes take place by a river. And then Paltrow also says that she likes to come to a bridge that her grandfather built, helped to build, (laughs) where she likes to think and observe the river. Now, this is what I'm saying, guys. The river is time. That's what it is. The bridge represents Paltrow's pause within that stream of time where she can kind of reflect on on what what's going to happen next so that that bridge across time is is, is sort of a demonstrative of, of of paltrow's pushing against the ever continuous flow of events paltrow sits, is on that bridge and able to sort of stop them for a while and and everything else occurs as as just time flows constantly and what you see is that needy Rasidi, john Hanna, he's a rower so he exists within the world of time. Like he, he doesn't sort of step out of it. He doesn't have any, he's just a happy-go-lucky guy rowing his way down the river of life. Whereas he's, the thing that is intriguing to him about Paltrow is that she's a bridge stander. She can stand above 
time and life events and temporarily just stand back and observe them and then enter as she wishes and only if she wishes. That, that's my theory about how, how sliding doors come together. Have you ever thought about doing a TED Talk? I thought that was amazing. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Thank you. I've thought about doing a TED Talk, but unfortunately one of the subjects that they, they don't usually want you to cover is kind of off-the-cuff bullshit. That's not something... <laughs> yeah, well, they might. I mean, what I would say is that it was beautifully said and you thought about it very nicely and it did make me think, well, rivers do split into two, into different branches. That was interesting. Yeah. But I did feel that in your speech, you made the case more for it being a sci-fi. Like It just sounded more like a sci-fi when you said it. Okay, I, I hear what you're saying. So, all right, let me but say... I did love it. Would the, would this please you more if then you've got the river, which represents time, the bridge, which represents um, the ability to stand above time. Now, Gwyneth Paltrow's grandfather made that bridge many years ago because he's beyond time. He is, a, he is, uh, he's from another time. <laughs> Gwyneth Paltrow's Ooh. grandfather came back from the future to build this bridge. <laughs> he is time. He's grandfather time. It's time, it's time itself. And um, and then obviously then Paltrow feels that connection that she goes back to that bridge, and that's uh, that's where she she sort of is able then to split off her two futures um, using uh, the secret crystal that her brand grandfather buried in that bridge um, uh, many years ago. I was about to say thousands of years ago, thousands of years ago when they built that bridge, <laughs> one of the thousand year old bridges. The, bridge, the bridges London. in London are old; they're not that old. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did think though there's got to be something there because why? Why it's such an odd line to be in the film, to you know, and I, and I have that thing where I love it with films where you just go, when you're writing a film, I bet people, you know, people, you you've been there when you're trying to put together something creative, you do end up getting so deeply into it that you end up putting little Easter eggs in there that even you probably don't understand why they're there. And I thought yeah. there's no reason at all for that line to exist if I'm saying my grandfather actually built helped build this bridge. Who gives a shit? And why is that even a thing? Um, so, you know, they've, they've made no evidence to flesh out her PR backstory, but apparently we need to know that her grandfather built a bridge. So I think and that's that she's a Gemini. All yeah, that it all, that's true. It all fits. <laughs> so my answer to your question, is it a sci-fi film, is uh, depends on uh, what flavour of nonsense you want me to spout at you. If you want me to try and convince you that it is, I'll do it. If you want me to try and convince you that it's not, bring it on. Not a problem. <laughs> Would you like it to be a sci-fi film, Neil? That's the question. Well, when I was watching it back, I was thinking this this is a rom com. Obviously, it's it's a great nineties film, but there's elements of it where you, where it spawned a lot of sci-fi. You know, with the whole idea of the sliding doors concept has yeah. been used in countless other films. Um, I think even on Wikipedia, I think there's one uh, the the Run Lola Run. Have you seen that film? Oh, I love that film. Yeah. 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 Lola Rent. Yeah, it's great. Uh, there was another TV show um, that I forget who the guy who was in it, but um, it was called Awake, where the guy, he had a car crash. And in, in one scenario, his kid died, but his wife survived. And in the other su scenario, his wife died. And every time he went to sleep, he flipped between worlds. So good, so good, and the idea of parallel worlds has just has always been fascinating to me. Like uh, Fringe, as well. Just so, yeah, I think it sort of has elements if you if you look at it in a certain way. But it's it's not knowing it that it is, but it is. Maybe we could we could write a screenplay, right? Where there's the three of us, and we're making this podcast, um, and then obviously we meet in a bar at one point, and in one reality we have Grolsch. And we were transported <laughs> all the way back to the 90s. <laughs> and, and then have to live out, out our lives just out of time uh, from there. That's one of them. And then yeah. in another one, we have like Baby Sham. And then we're shoved all the way back to the late 1970s, early 1980s. But, yeah, you know, I, I, I'll flesh it out. But what I'm saying is Grolsch time travel. I think it could work. Just, just because... booze-based time travel, depending on what you drink. Yeah. Depends where you go. Think about it, Miriam. It's got everything. It's got time travel, sci-fi business, which you love and Neil loves. You're, you both love your yeah. sci-fi. I love my sci-fi. Then on top of that, 
you've got booze on top of that so product you can, placement that, that links that, exactly you've got product <laughs> placement you've got money which we all love and then, then we, we could maybe work in a few cocktails and stuff that you could do in there as well so that that could work for you i'll do the soundtrack and um Bob, bob's your uncle we could we can make this happen let's go we just yeah we need just something as snappy as sliding doors grolshy <laughs> Smoking indoors. <laughs> smoking, smoking indoors. <laughs> that would be the magic thing that transports us. Like the first time, it's us drinking Grolsch, forces us back to the nineties, and the second time, it's, it's it's me lighting up a Marlboro Red indoors. And just just as someone's about to tell me you absolutely can't do that, it's like suddenly Dido comes on, and um, <laughs> but he's gone cold. I'm wondering why. And we're back. We're back in 1998. Yeah, I think it's got legs. I think it's got more than legs. I'm going to start writing this tonight. <laughs> after, I, after I finish reading the, the rest of Hoods tonight, which might distract me, so it might end up having quite a lot of Nottingham crime flavour to this, screen, this screenplay, I'm going to start writing the screenplay to, uh, what are we calling it? Grolsch, Smoking Indoors. That's the working booze, title. Booze Doors. Smo- <laughs> smoking, smoking Inside Booze Doors. Um, the Grolsch Chronicles. That's, oh, it's a working title. We'll we'll we'll, we'll get about one. Heard it here first. We'll one. <laughs> Smoking indoors. Oh, I see. Now I see what you did there. Like oh. sliding doors. Smoking yes. doors. Smoking doors. Lovely. Yeah, as long as we get people to say it like that, it should work. Any any final thoughts on sliding doors? Well, I didn't know whether um because we, we did push I just wanted to say thank you to the people who mentioned other rom coms of the nineties and hopefully we will get to some of those at a later stage, particularly The Beautician and the Beast, which is a dream. I think <laughs> everyone needs to go and watch it immediately. Bring it because it's I, I look on that numbers.com, it's only three hundred and eighty. In all time worldwide box office sales for rom com movies, and something like you know Notting Hill is at number eight, and I just think we need to sort that out because I think Beautician and the Beast is better. That's my. I thought. agree, and and uh, I, I will say I'm I'm not a rom com kind of guy, as you know. I hate to laugh and I hate love, so they're both the things that I, I hate. Want. It's not true. Yeah. <laughs> But um, so this is a journey for me. So throw the throw the nineties rom coms at me. I feel like I missed out on a lot of rom com time. So you know, Sliding Doors has been a great entree into that world, and I hope to revisit it soon. That's yeah, what I'll, I'll send say. you. I'll send you a list, a little watch list, and say watch these ones. Maybe save if you haven't seen the Beautician of the Beast. Maybe save that because after watching all the others, you'll be like, this is a breath of fresh air <laughs> and kind of <laughs> madness. <laughs> Okay. Well, I can't wait. I I I can't wait to de- to delve to delve in to the world of nineties rom com. So th- and nice. thank you, Neil, for making us watch Sliding Doors. I had a great time. Thank you, Neil. Thank you for that lovely choice. Uh, and I'm I'm glad that you finally got us to watch your absolute favourite film of all time, Sliding Doors. <laughs> That sliding doors tattoo that you've got on your back. <laughs> <laughs> one shoulder blade, it's long head paltro. One shoulder blade, it's short head paltro. Yeah. Then you sort of squeeze them together in the gym and you're like, that's, and then you shout, that's how reality works. And then you stalk off. You, you know that's true. You know, it's, you haven't seen me in a while. You know it's true. <laughs>